Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we discuss clinical topics in gastroenterology. My name is Jennifer Tam. I'm a gastroenterology trainee in the west of Scotland. Today's topic is the management of acute decomposition of liver disease, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Rachel Swan, a consultant gastroenterologist in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So, patients presenting with acute decompensation of their liver disease is extremely common in the medical take, and I think it's really important that we know how to manage these patients very well. So, can you tell us a wee bit about what, what do we mean when we say acute decompensation of liver disease? Of course. So, decompensation of liver cirrhosis is deterioration of liver synthetic function to the point where it manifests in a number of clinical syndromes, namely ascites, encephalopathy, jaundice, hepatorenal syndrome, varicocele bleeding, and some would also include infection or sepsis within that definition. There's no fixed definition of acute decompensation, but really for the purposes of this discussion, we'll talk about the patient who presents with new decompensation or worsening of their liver synthetic function in the context of decompensated liver disease presenting to hospital. Within this group, there are also patients who present with something called acute on chronic liver failure, which is a relatively new concept defined by acute liver decompensation, um, organ failures, usually more than one, and a high short-term mortality. And what are the common precipitants of acute decompensation in liver disease? So there can be many different possible precipitants of acute decompensation. Infection is very common. So for example, in acute on chronic liver failure, about 40% of patients will have an infectious precipitant and similar for acute decompensation. Sometimes bacterial translocation or bacteremia or dysbiosis could have an impact on decompensation even when there's not an overt infection. Ongoing toxic damage to the liver from alcohol, for example, or inflammation from viral hepatitis, for example, chronic hepatitis or hepatitis A or E, or even COVID infection, as we've discovered recently, um, can also cause decompensation. Sometimes medications that we give um, and other iatrogenic insults such as post-surgical can lead to a decompensation event. Um, so it's important to be mindful that the cirrhotic liver, in particular the decompensating liver, has differential metabolism of drugs. For our patients with ascites, we give them diuretics which can prompt a kidney injury and a electrolyte imbalance which can then lead to decompensation. GI bleeding while it's also part of a decompensation syndrome in terms of variceal bleeding, can also prompt further decompensation. And it's important to remember structural causes of decompensation, for example, hepatocellular carcinoma or portal vein thrombosis. So how do we approach these patients when they present to hospital? So I would hope your audience would be familiar with the excellent basal acute decompensated liver bundle developed by Stuart McPherson and his team at the Freeman in Newcastle. If they're not familiar, then this can be easily found on the BSG or Basel websites. This details the simple steps that we use to assess the patient first presenting to hospital with acute decompensation. Firstly, it's important to do simple blood tests to look for acute kidney injury, electrolyte imbalance, and also to do an, a screen for infection. In patients with ascites, an acidic tap is really important, and the bundle suggests doing this within the first six hours of presentation. It's important to remind our generalist colleagues that in patients with clinically detectable moderate or large ascites, we don't need to have a prior ultrasound or correction of coagulopathy to do an acidic tap. The acidic tap can be done as early as practical in these patients um, to exclude SBP. In terms of infection screen, the other things we need to do are look at the urine, chest x-ray, blood cultures, and a review of the skin, particularly in patients with edema, cellulitis can be common. Also, as part of the clinical assessment, a PR examination to exclude GI bleeding is useful at this point, and an ultrasound should be requested to exclude portal vein thrombosis and look for signs of hepatocellular carcinoma. The bundle contains guidance on managing alcohol withdrawal and decompensation in those at risk, particularly about prescribing benzodiazepines which are less likely to cause encephalopathy. The medication chart should be reviewed, and for those with acute kidney injury or electrolyte imbalance, nephrotoxics and diuretics should be reviewed and, and ideally discontinued if possible. For patients with encephalopathy, any sedating medications or constipating medications again should be reviewed and ideally stopped and laxatives prescribed and consideration given to uh, rifaximin for example. 
in the acute kidney injury, also fluid resuscitation should be initiated. And if the patient's felt to have hepatorenal syndrome and is not responding to fluid resuscitation alone, then terlipressin should be considered. The bundle also details considering other, diag other possible diagnoses. For example, performing a CT scan to exclude subdural hematoma in patients presenting with confusion, as these patients have coagulopathy and may have this as an additional pathology. One aspect that the bundle doesn't cover, but I think is increasingly important, is the role of nutrition and assessing nutritional status in patients with decompensated liver disease. We know that sarcopenia and undernutrition contributes to poor outcomes in these patients and can increase risk of encephalopathy, for example. Therefore, if it's possible to assess nutritional status and institute dietetic review at the front door when these patients come in, then we give them a better chance of optimising their nutritional status. Finally, the bundle talks about the importance of specialist review, particularly relevant for areas where there isn't a dedicated GI or hepatology receiving unit. And this is so that specialist treatments such as steroids for alcoholic hepatitis, for example, can be considered. Great. So you mentioned alcoholic hepatitis. How do we distinguish between alcoholic hepatitis and acute decompensation of liver disease? So that's a really interesting question. We know that 80% of patients presenting with alcoholic hepatitis have underlying liver cirrhosis and they will present with features consistent with decompensation. So the question I guess we need to ask is, does this patient simply have decompensation of their liver disease or do they have additional alcoholic hepatitis on top? Clinically, patients with alcoholic hepatitis might have increased temperature, they might have raised inflammatory markers and they might have tender hepatomegaly, but these features are not always present. Therefore, it's sometimes difficult to make the distinction clinically, although we know that histologically and biochemically there are clear differences between the patient with alcoholic hepatitis and the patient with simple decompensation of alcohol-related cirrhosis. What I tend to look at are, are two things. First of all, the alcohol history. So you can perform the FAST questionnaire or the Audit C questionnaire to look for signs of harmful drinking. A collateral history is also really important. We would expect to see an alcohol intake of around 50 grams per day for the months preceding presentation in alcoholic hepatitis. Sometimes the patients stop drinking or reduce their drinking immediately prior to admission because they feel unwell, but it's important that the patient has had alcohol intake within the six to eight weeks preceding admission. The other thing that is important to look at is bilirubin and liver blood tests. So most of the alcohol hepatitis trials have a minimum bilirubin level in their inclusion criteria. So we would normally expect a bilirubin minimum of 50 and usually above 80 to diagnose alcohol hepatitis. The ALT and AST levels can also be important. Usually in alcohol hepatitis, the AST is greater than the ALT and it's very unusual to see an ALT above 300 and certainly not above 400. So if the patient has an ALT above this level, we need to really think, is there any evidence of an alternative cause drug-induced hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis or viral hepatitis, and whether or not we need a liver biopsy at this stage. So we've now diagnosed our patient with alcoholic hepatitis. Can you talk us through the management of alcoholic hepatitis? Certainly. So as we mentioned before, the majority of these patients will have underlying liver cirrhosis and present with features of decompensation. So they should be managed according to the decompensated liver bundle. In addition, we can separate these patients into patients with severe alcohol hepatitis with a poor outcome and non-severe. There are several scores we can use to do this. Traditionally, the MADRI discriminant function was used using prothrombin time and bilirubin with a score of 32 or greater suggesting poor mortality. More recently, the Glasgow Alcoholic Hepatitis score is found to have a better discrimination between those who have a higher mortality. And this is a score consisting of parameters such as age, white cell count, urea, bilirubin and prothrombin time. Usually a GAS score of 9 or greater indicates poor outcome and is an indication for steroid treatment in these patients. For steroid treatment, we would normally give 40 milligrams of prednisolone for 28 days um, in those with a GAS of 9. In terms of assessing response to steroids, we usually check the blood tests on day seven, and at this point can calculate the allele score 
an allele score of greater than 0.45 suggests non-response to steroids and a poor outcome. And therefore, if that's the case, the steroids should be stopped and a consideration to parallel advanced care planning at this stage. There are a number of other considerations with steroids. We know that patients with infection and GI bleeding do badly with steroids. So in patients with active untreated infection or bleeding, steroids would be initially contraindicated, although they could be started um, once these conditions are controlled. Also, if a patient is on steroids and then develops an acute infection or GI bleeding, the steroids should be paused at this stage. The STOPA trial showed that prednisolone 40 milligrams for 28 days impacted on mortality at 28 days, but didn't impact on longer term mortality. So we still need to find other strategies to treat these patients. What other things can we consider? So pentoxifilin was examined in the STOPA trial and found to have no effect. So this is no longer recommended. Nutrition is really important. And there are several randomized control trials that show nutrition and optimizing nutrition is as effective as steroid therapy. So early dietetic review, consideration of enteral feeding with NG tubes if needed to allow patients to, to meet their targets um, is something we should consider early in these patients. The EASL guidelines also mention N-acetylcysteine and there is some evidence for this being effective but not ro as robust as for steroids. In terms of longer term mortality however, the most important thing for these patients is abstinence from alcohol, and that's really what's going to predict their mortality in the long term. So in the acute setting, it's vitally important we do brief interventions for these patients, that we plug them into alcohol or addictions teams while they're inpatients, and ensure early and assertive outreach for these individuals. And some clinical teams have incorporated addictions teams within their outpatients for patients presenting with alcohol hepatitis. For example, the GLASS service at Glasgow Royal Infirmary, which has been shown to reduce readmissions. Finally, there is possibly a role for transplantation in some selected patients. So there was a trial performed in around 2015 where patients under the age of 40 with no previous admissions with alcohol-related causes were put forward for transplantation. Unfortunately, because of the restrictive entry criteria, there were no patients recruited to this trial in the UK. And I think transplantation very much is not an option for the majority of patients in the UK at this time. So acute on chronic liver failure is a relatively recently recognised syndrome. But how do we distinguish it from acute decompensation of liver disease? So acute and chronic liver failure is probably best used as a subtype of um, acute decompensation of liver disease as it occurs in patients who have chronic liver disease um, in the context of decompensation. So to diagnose acute and chronic liver failure we need several things. Firstly underlying significant liver disease with cirrhosis or fibrosis with an acute decompensation usually with jaundice. Secondly we need organ failures usually cardiovascular, renal, respiratory, but also brain failure, coagulation failure, for example. And thirdly, we know that this syndrome is associated with a high mortality, but patients can improve with supportive care. In terms of precipitating factors, um, infection is a common precipitating factor, and we know that patients with acute and chronic liver failure tend to have dysfunction of their inflammatory regulating systems. So you mentioned that uh acute on chronic liver failure of a high mortality. How do we assess the prognosis of these patients? So there's a really handy um, calculator online. Essentially, mortality is linked to the number of organ failures. Um, the calculator is the EF Cliff C ACLF calculator and looks at the number of organ failures as defined by their specific criteria. It also uses age and white cell count to give an estimated mortality at one, three, six, and 12 months. And this can be used to prognosticate for your patients. Obviously, it only takes into account their, their liver and specific organ failures and not other aspects such as frailty. A score of 70 or above really indicates an extremely poor prognosis. But we tend to find that the trajectory of scores is more important than the absolute score. For example, a patient whose score is trending upwards towards 70 is unlikely to improve with further supportive care, and that might tend to lead to a re-evaluation of treatment goals. Whereas a patient whose treatment, whose scores are trending downwards, 
um, is obviously responding to treatment and therefore hopefully will continue to improve. And looking at scores at zero and then 40 hours is a good length of time with which to compare scores. What are the treatment options available for ACLF? So at the present there are no targeted treatment options for ACLF, although research is ongoing regarding this. So really supportive care is the mainstay of treatment. We know that at least 40% of these patients will have infection and so it's really important to pay attention to detail in looking for infection and also other reversible causes of liver disease, screening for other causes of an acute hepatitis. Supportive care for organ failures such as inotropes for blood pressure support or filtration for aneuric renal failure for example are also important in the acute setting if they're felt appropriate for that patient. Therefore they would normally be uh, looked after in the HDU or ITU setting. As I've mentioned, research is ongoing to try and find any particular targets within the inflammatory response that might be used as therapy, but as yet these are experimental. Finally, we know that uh, there's growing evidence that transplantation can be a very effective treatment for patients with ACLF3 or above. So I'm not a transplant hepatologist, so I won't go to, into that in great detail, but there is currently a national panel of transplant hepatologists who can review on a case-by-case -case basis patients with ACLF3 to, and a greater to see if they're suitable for listing for transplantation under that criteria. In general, these would be patients who are relatively young, under 60, with few comorbidities. So if you do have a patient who's listed for transplant or being actively considered for transplant, who presents with ACLF, it's certainly worth an early discussion with your local transplant centre. That's great, thank you. I guess my last question is, what would your take home points be from this topic? Certainly, so firstly, I think it's really important to remember that patients with liver cirrhosis can decompensate and become quite unwell very quickly. So thorough assessment with attention to detail, particularly looking for infection, optimising nutrition and using the bundle is important early on. Secondly, to remember alcohol hepatitis and the specific treatments in this group and particularly the importance of getting addictions involved and helping maintain abstinence in the long term. And finally, just really to be aware that acute and chronic liver failure is a relatively new phenomenon, but it does exist and there are new treatments emerging. So really to keep an eye out for further guidance um, to follow on this. Perfect. Thank you for this excellent run through on this really relevant topic. And thank you for joining us for Digest This.